you ever heard the phrase, I would be ashamed to be afraid and afraid to be ashamed? I think I remember that being said by some years ago, but I, I don't hear it of late. I may, I may hear some things or have heard some things that sort of convey the same idea. But I remember this in particular said, particularly said by preachers of the gospel. I'd be ashamed to be afraid and afraid to be ashamed. I know some of that's tied in with a passage we quote many times around here. Paul's own writing in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And of course, Paul's life and his work made that very clear about him. I'd be ashamed to be afraid and afraid to be ashamed. But today, when you look around us, and it's been going on for some time, and there's always been some people that have been ashamed of the gospel, obviously so, or Paul wouldn't want to have written, would not have written what he did to the church at Rome almost 2,000 years ago. But there was a time in the church when members were armed with the truth better than they are today. I speak in generalities now. They were better able to explain and ready to explain the truth to anyone who would listen. Especially if you go back to the 19th century, people would say, oh, that's it bunch from the church of Christ all they want to do is dispute that was the way they said of dispute well there was an effort on the part of people in those days because of their conviction of the truth by the truth of the gospel and the truth about the church and what it was and the great difference there was between the Lord's church and the churches of men and they were looking for opportunities to teach those things, to get people to see truly what the New Testament taught concerning the plan of salvation, at what point one becomes a Christian, what a Christian is, the church, its work, its organization, its worship, the errors of denominationalism and that kind of thing. Well, today we add to that, of course, in the area of apologetics, the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the plenary inspiration, plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures. All of that's needful. Some of it takes a little more scholarship maybe than others. But nevertheless, there is a need to be ready to answer every man. The answer, word answer there comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to make a defense. We need to know the truth well enough and be convicted by that truth and have enough love for God and the people who need that truth to look for every opportunity possible to teach it. Now, the world in which we live today is probably worse than it ever was, at least in our history in these United States, because everybody wants to live and let live. And over the years, uh, don't be judgmental. Don't judge me. I think the easiest thing about that is God has already judged you and he's recorded it in the Bible. And you can read it just to see where you stand with him. We quote it so often, we probably miss just how uh, plain that is when it comes down to all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And then I usually follow up with Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Well, that's plain. Well, in fact, just talk about sin. You might find it a very interesting thing to talk to people and say, well, what do you think sin is? How does the person come to sin? How does God view sin? Of course, if you know your scriptures, you know that's the only thing 
that can cause you to be separated from God. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And since all have sinned, then we've all transgressed God's will, and we stand condemned before Him. We can't save ourselves. No group of men can save ourselves. We must look to God to save us. It's on His terms that we're saved, and those terms are set out in the last will and testament of His Son. But when you're living in an age that says, don't rock the boat. Uh, don't make anybody feel uncomfortable. And something's bad wrong, and I'll tell you why. The people who hold that view do not believe it at all. Because they sure intend to make me feel uncomfortable if I say, you must be a Christian, as that term is used and defined in the New Testament. And be faithful to Christ in order to go to heaven. They hate that. Even people who don't even understand what New Testament Christianity is. They are against them. Even the idea of God. And so you find these kind of things going on. But God says through his son's last will and testament. That we're to be a different kind of people. Our outlook on life, our viewpoint of ourselves, one another, and the world is completely different because we're seeing it as God sees it. I want to pause here and say this about what I just said. We spend our lives in being faithful to God and all that that means in His Son's church. Trying to see things as God sees things. Seeing the world for what it really is. And not be enamored with the deception of Satan. Paul wrote, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Now think about that. That wasn't written this morning, five years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It's almost 2,000 years ago. The world functions today even as it functioned then. Languages change, customs change, technology changes, science changes, but people remain people. They're moved by the same things. And the Bible is written to accommodate you and to accommodate me so we can know God's will and know how to live. He said basically the same thing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We talked about that recently in our study of Ephesians 5. But notice not some fellowship. Not some sharing and participation. Not a little bit. But it's no fellowship. Then he talks about the unfruitful works of darkness. Well, darkness is contrasted with the light, and light is the truth. Well, if light is the truth, and it is, we've studied about that lately too, and darkness is error, and that which is wickedness, then the only thing that brings forth that which is not good is darkness. And thus you have the singular fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5 and the component parts of that singular fruit of the Spirit, which we bear because we're faithful. So God expects His people to separate themselves from the world and its influence. Now, unless someone get mixed up, we're not talking about wearing clothes that identify you with a certain group. Save that all men and women ought to dress modestly as the Bible defines the same. And that we're to be mindful of how people view us and our conduct. And I recognize that customs and dress change as the years go by. I realize that some customs in some countries are considerably different in dress than ours. But modesty is modesty is modesty. The principles of modesty starts out in the heart and teaches us how we present our bodies 
to the world because it's how we present our minds to God that makes a difference to how we present our bodies to the world. God's people must be willing to answer and do what's necessary to be able to answer all of those who ask us of the reason, the hope that's within us with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. Have you ever had people approach you from time to time that, and I think it will be seldom, but nevertheless, it's a refreshing thing to me when they do come up and begin to ask me questions about what I believe or why we do this or what do I think about God or what do I think about religion. Well, I wish they would be asking me that all the time. And it would allow me to say a lot of things. But then on the other hand, as I said often recently and over the years many times, we sometimes just have to see something in some, or hear something in somebody's speech or maybe even what they do, we see it. And it gives us a chance to say, why are you doing that? We don't think about that, but that's an excellent way to get somebody's attention. Somebody says something they shouldn't. Why did you do that? What made you say that? Some people just, in fact, I guess most of us in some things, just simply have ways of saying things when certain things come up. And we don't think about that by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Or out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. We are expected in being the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the leavening influence for good is God defines good and that's all that matters. We're expected to cause people to think about those things. Paul prayed for boldness. Now if he prayed for boldness, so what does that say about you and me? He said to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 6, Verses 18 and 19. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Then he focused in on himself. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel that I may speak boldly, that I won't hold anything back that needs to be said to somebody else because they're lost in sin and they must understand that. Paul would have been different from the society which surrounded him because they pretty well had worked it all out to let everybody do as they please, not unlike today. The reason some don't speak out, though, is because they're afraid to be different from everyone else. Uh, I, you know I've already told you that I'm not talking about being different just to be different. I'm talking about as you obey the truth of the gospel concerning Christian living, that makes you automatically different in the choices you make, how you deal with people, how you deal with yourself, how you deal with your family, and so on. But there's no way you can be sanctified, which we're expected to be. We're saints. To be holy, dedicated to serving God, and not be set apart. People are afraid of what other folks will think about them. There's a whole host of folks who just soon to go through life and keep their mouth shut rather than to have people think that they oppose what they're doing. But that can't be and us be what God says we ought to be. In other words, it's, it's part of being faithful to say things to get people to think. So we become ashamed, really, but we will not do what we ought to do and we will not speak the word of God when that happens. I think we have the idea that speaking the word of God only covers what I'm doing right now or in the Bible class. But you must remember that many of those sermons, uh, texts that we use for sermons from our Lord came out of personal one-on-one -on -one 
conversations. And that tells me he did that everywhere he went, just like he did the miracles that confirmed him to be the Son of God and not of men, that he was ready to say things to people to make them think, to get them to understand those things. So what do we say to members of our own family? What do we say to those in the workplace, in the school, and our neighbors relative to the things that are contrary to the Word of God that's a natural, we might say that, at least second nature to them? So I'd be ashamed to be afraid and afraid to be ashamed in those situations. Now, by way of, of exhortation, I want us to examine the statement again, I'd be ashamed to be afraid. What would you say would be one of the most powerful tools that the devil has to get you to sin, to get the Lord's work not done, to hinder the Lord's work? Well, I think it's fear. Fear. Fear is one of the most powerful tools of the devil. And he used it well as God prepared to deliver the Israelites at the hand of Gideon. I won't read back that again, but in Judges chapter 6 and 7, Judges 6 and 7. Notice that the number of fighting men of Israel was too high for God to use them because he knew they would glory in themselves, lift themselves up with pride and say, we did this. God then, of course, instructed Gideon to ask all those who feared to return home. You ever notice? Two-thirds of the crowd went home. I guess I can say at least they were honest. <laughs> they went home. In Judges 7, 2 and 3, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites in their hands. Now, you think about the way we think today and what it takes for us to do what God requires the church to do in spreading the gospel and doing the work. We think, we think unless we have a whole lot of money in the bank account, unless we have all sorts of things, then we can't do it. We think like men who don't know the Bible. And he said that uh, send these people home because lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. You're real, real spiritual Israel. We can be guilty of the same thing. Well, I just can't see how we can do this. But God can if you will trust him. And notice what he said. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. Judges 7, 2, and 3. What would you think about that, the way armies fought in those days, or even in recent years? If you were getting ready to fight, and two-thirds of the army went home because they said, we're scared. Today, the percentage would probably be as great as then, and for the same reason. The devil makes us afraid. I read a thing, and I don't know how true this is, but having gone through some of these things, at least the part of beginning from the early days to speak and knowing what stage fright is, that there was a higher percentage of people afraid of public speaking than there were to die. <laughs> and I think that may be true, because I haven't talked to anybody that no matter how good in their abilities they are and how well honed those abilities are to speak, that the first time and maybe the first several times they got up to speak, they were just afraid. That's the only thing to say. Well, what makes a person keep on doing it when he's afraid? What makes a person do that? 
because he's convicted of the truth and his personal responsibility to God to use his talents and abilities to serve God. He has something to say. It's not that he wants to just say something, but he has something to say. First of all, the Lord tells us not to fear man or what man can do to us. That's not very easy. You read about these soldiers fighting some terrible battles. Well, what the other side, quote, quote, it's always the other side, what the enemy would do to them was enough to make anybody afraid. Why did they fight? Well, maybe it was self-preservation. Sometimes I know it was. In fact, most of the time it might have been. But they still fought. Jesus said, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. You know, if we could just get that instilled in every member of the church like it ought to be, and the people that we try to teach to convert, we would have gone a long way in getting them to be serious about their Bible study and about becoming Christians and living the Christian life. But many today fear man, and they don't fear God. The wise man Solomon instructs us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10. Uh, there's a reason for that. One who properly fears God with all and respect will have the mind, I guess is the way to put it, to seek God's wisdom, do what's necessary in his or her own life to find it and then to put it into practice. Fear of man has long been the, the one reason for compromising the truth. Preachers joke about it a lot, but that's what really happens. If I preach this sermon, it is a moving sermon. And that certainly has been the case many times with preachers preaching to people who have itching ears, who don't want to hear it, because it makes them feel guilty and they don't want to feel guilty because that means that I'm lost and they don't want to feel lost, but they want to keep doing what they like to do. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Anybody that is going to live a faithful Christian life, but especially one who's going to be a teacher of truth, uh, especially elders of the church, anybody, though, who's faithful to the church, then they must understand you have to do things that are not necessarily pleasing to everybody. Now, what gets me is that you've got all these worldly politicians who run for office, and in getting elected and staying in office and maybe running for higher office and so on, do you realize how many people that they make angry at them? And not just angry, if they get the chance to get the power, they will ruin them. And not a few over history have been put to death and kingdoms have been overthrown because of those things. And yet we who are members of the kingdom of Christ citizens of the kingdom with our great king we're afraid to speak up <clears throat> we're afraid to do those things second we should be ashamed to be afraid because the prophets were not afraid <clears throat> when we under the new testament are ashamed to be afraid we forget all of those prophets we read about and talk about and extol that put up with so much. And of course, if you read Hebrews 11, you, you see the situation. But think about what you read when, uh, uh, when you talk about, or when the Old Testament talks about Elijah, Elisha, Obadiah, Amos, Ezekiel, prior to them, Samuel, others. Think about their work. They, if you read very far about them, they were in a mess a good part of the time. They were in danger so much of the time because they lived like God wanted them to. 
and they taught the truth to other people. But as a result of their courage, then many heard the word of God. Now, it may be true that most did not obey, but they still heard what they needed to hear because of the courage of the prophets. And that's one of the things written before time for our learning is the courage of the prophets to do what they did. And they never knew what we know about salvation. They never had the insights that we have because of the great teaching of the New Testament. So we need to learn to stand before such wicked characters as Ahab, wherever they may be of our day, in the church or out. And in doing so, boldly stand and proclaim that you are the troublers of Israel, not those who teach the truth and live it. But yet I think you will find as time goes by, and if you haven't learned this already, you haven't been a Christian long, that if you stand consistently with regularity for the truth and oppose those things that are wrong as the truth defines the wrong, then you're going to find yourself being labeled a troublemaker. There will be every way under the sun that's done, and by some in the church. We should not forget that it was God's people who had been instructed for 1,500 long years with the law of Moses as a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, yet the leaders of the people put him to death. That ought to tell us something about where problems can come from. In James 5, James is inspired of the Spirit to say this about the Old Testament prophets. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Now, patience is bearing up under the load without stopping doing right. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. That's the idea of patience. You have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. But the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy, James 5, 10 through 11. And what an exhortation for us to heed, and one that everybody that's faithful is going to heed. Another point. I think it's number three. We should be ashamed to be afraid because the apostles of Christ were not afraid. I have always stood amazed at what those people underwent for the cause of Christ. Just the partial list of what Paul gives us that he underwent. Luke records what Peter and John answered and said unto them when they were told not to preach any longer in the name of Christ, whether it be right the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard, Acts 4, 19 through 20. And if you're faithful today, we cannot but speak the things which we know the Bible to teach. In Acts 5, 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, one thing we can say about this, that's the type of courage that's always needed in whatever generation this is being preached in. We should be ashamed to be afraid because the fearful will burn in the devil's hell forever, which is the second death of which there is no escape. In Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful. I don't think we ever recognize that he puts fearful right alongside murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and the idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is second death. Again, Revelation 21.8. Now, moving from that, look at the little comment, I'm, I'd be afraid to be ashamed. Jesus said, and Mark records it, Mark 3, or rather 8, in verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Well, that's just up to date. It's today's newspaper. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. Well, I don't want to be found in that crowd. But he's telling me, if you won't speak the truth or live the truth before people who oppose it, 
And you're ashamed of me. You're ashamed of me. And of course we know what we started out with from Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And when he wrote the second letter to Timothy, Paul exhorted Timothy not to be ashamed. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.8. Afflictions of the gospel, how is that the case? When you live like the gospel said and you preach and defend the gospel, then what's going to happen? Well, everybody's not going to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? A whole lot of them are going to seek to persecute you and shut your mouth up. I don't know whether Timothy was buckling under any kind of pressure or seeming to in the work in Ephesus, but he needed that exhortation, and you do and I do. Paul continued by saying, for the which cause I also suffer these things. You're not the only one going through this. All faithful people, to one extent or the other, one way or the other, go through it. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, sometimes you don't have to know a whole lot. Not that we want to remain ignorant. We want to learn the Bible. We want to know more of it. We want to put it into practice. But I remember one time riding in a, a commuting, actually, to college. I guess I was probably a sophomore from my hometown and there were five of us that commuted, four drove cars, one a week, and then one would pay to ride. I remember one time, and this boy's been dead a long time now. He was a class behind me in high school. He was riding. And I certainly didn't know anywhere nearly what I know now. And that's not saying I don't need to know more now. It just meant comparing now with then is a big difference. But he was talking, and I don't know how it got around to it, but this is in my mind. He said, well, what if it turns out that the Buddhists or the, uh, the Mohammedans, as he said, what if it turns out somebody of them were right and Christians aren't? Well, I just simply quoted this verse. For I know in whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. There was a whole lot more could have been said but that seemed to be sufficient because the car got pretty quiet. And I learned something back in those days. Right in the beginning. There's something you can say. There's something you can do. You may have to back it up, which you ought to be willing to. My first semester, I roomed with the guy that had got out of the Navy. He was several years older than me, and every other word was the Lord's name in vain. And I finally got just so tired of it. He came in one day, something had happened in class, and he was mad, and he was letting loose a blue streak. I just said, I told you, if you keep on doing that, I'm not going to stay in here. So I just promptly moved out and moved in another room. <laughs> My point is this, in those formative years, I learned that you can't just coast. You have to do and you have to say and you have to not do things. And they're usually more important when you do them before the people who need to see them or hear them. I guess some people say, well, you're too young to have much sense anyway. I, rem I remember leaving the first semester, maybe second semester English class. And that fellow was good when he was stick with whatever he was supposed to be teaching. But of course, as they do in so many arts and humanities, they try to challenge your long held views and coming from a place like Arkansas, then they are always trying to kick against religion in some way or the other. So I uh, turned in my test paper and somebody said, well, you could have been a little more diplomatic and figured out a better time to say it. But as I stood before the desk and turned in my test paper, I said, uh, Mr. Reed, 
I really enjoyed this class when you taught the subject matter. But when you got off on all, and I said some things that he got off on, I said, you know better than that, just as well as I do. <laughs> he just looked up at me and smiled, and I left. I passed the course, but, but somebody might have said, well, couldn't you have said that after you got your grade? Well, I know whether I'd see him again or not. There I was, uh, 17, 18 years old, but I learned those things then. If I'm going to be what God says I ought to be, you don't say tomorrow I'll do it. You don't say when I get a college education. You stand up for what is right. Think about the one church. We should not be ashamed. But there's only one church that's acceptable to God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because anybody that knows the Bible knows Jesus said, I will build my church, C-H-U-R-C-H, singular. And he did, Acts chapter 2. And he adds all those who are saved to it, and he doesn't say, you're saved by me, now pick whatever church you want to set up. I'll start one. If there's none out here, that suits you, just start one. Because everybody knows the church has nothing to do with serving Christ. When somebody says that, I say, have you ever read your New Testament? And if you have, do you believe it? And so I learned a long time ago to say, well, if you believe that, it must be found in the New Testament. Show me. Of course, most of the time they can't do it. They don't know how to begin. Or if they try, they misuse a passage. Same thing's true of baptism. I didn't say baptism saves us. No other human being originated that. The Holy Spirit through Peter said baptism doth also now save us. Jesus Christ, as Mark by inspiration recorded, said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Well, if you don't believe, you're not going to be saved. But if you do believe, you need to be baptized for the right reason. That's clear, except that you have to have help from people who don't believe it to misunderstand it. People who are believers were taught they must repent after belief and before they were baptized. And the baptism was for or unto the remission or forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul, who was a believer and was a penitent, was told as a believing, penitent person, and now what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. To call on the name of the Lord is to appeal to the authority of Christ. And Christ said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We ought to use every opportunity to say those things. A lot of what we do or not do, how we do it, a lot of the things we mess up is simply because we're afraid. And we're ashamed. But I'd be ashamed to be afraid. And afraid to be ashamed. Why should I expect the Lord to say to me on the day of judgment, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. When in my daily living before my parents, my siblings, my friends, schoolmates, whatever, I was afraid to say anything about the error we know they're in. Why should I expect the Lord to say, oh, you're just what I want. You lived your life just like, like you ought to live it. So sometimes a lot that's standing between us and being what God expects us to be is that we're simply afraid. If you're not a child of God in the process of this lesson, we studied what one must do to be saved from sin and be a child of God. As a child of God, if you sin, you must repent of those sins. Confess them, pray God for forgiveness, and God will forgive you. And I'm glad to end on that note. God stands ready to forgive anybody who will respond to his invitation and meet his terms of pardon. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, I invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.